If I may get your attention, we'll get started. Hey, hate to break up the, the fellowship. Looks like everybody's enjoying meeting and greeting and talking. But we'll tr be respectful of your time. We're starting just a few minutes late. We had s some folks coming in, and we may have some more joining us. But let me give you just a brief overview of what we want to do tonight. The thing that I campaigned on is that we would get out in the community and meet you, talk to you, and then listen to what you have to say. A lot of times you see people campaigning and getting out and meeting and greeting and talking and shaking hands, and then where do they go? Well, one of the things that I wanted to do is get back out in the communities, talk to you, and then listen to what you have to say. Uh, a lot of times we can be guilty of talking a lot, but sometimes maybe not listening a lot. So I want to take just a few minutes, touch a couple of uh, items, and then uh, open it up to you for some questions. We had our first meeting in tributary, what, week, two weeks ago? And somebody told me that I talked too much. I told them I couldn't imagine that, but I did. So I'm going to try not to talk quite as much tonight but do want to touch on a couple of specific things and then open it up to you for questions. But before, and then we'll work to be through by 7.30. I uh, know that there's a lot of things you could be doing, a lot of other places you could be, but certainly appreciate you turning out to uh, let us talk, you listen, you listen, us talk. I mean, you talk, us listen. So before we get started, though, I would like to introduce some people to you. First of all, we have Mayor Pro Tem Larry Yockey with us. I believe most of you are familiar with uh, Mr. Yockey. I think he uh, does something some here in the subdivision, right? Yeah, for uh, 14 years, I've been president of the Homework Association. So. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but if you would, if you got a, some comments or some things you'd like to say. Uh, yeah, just a few things. Uh, okay, they want me on this microphone. Um, there's a, just a couple of things. Uh, as you probably have seen on Arbor Parkway, uh, we are starting the construction. There's going to be a sidewalk that's going to go from, from this clubhouse, basically across the street from here, all the way to Highway 5. And uh, the light poles have already been removed. And uh, now if you'll drive up Arbor Parkway, you'll see a bunch of trees with big old pink and white uh, X's on them. All those trees will be coming down. Uh, they are, uh, it's going to be nine feet from the curb, so it pretty much goes back to the white fencing, and so a, a clear shot all the way down. So that's what's happening, uh, happening there. Um, it should, it's going to be a four-month project, at le around a four-month project, and uh, as you can see over here, uh, right here on Parkway Circle, that's just a small piece of it. We didn't have to remove any trees. That's just a correction that has been going on for a long time. There's actually debris from the builder underneath that, uh, underneath the sidewalk and the street. And I can't imagine builders doing that, but back in those days, they did. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but that's being corrected by the city. The city is main actually doing that particular project. And the project that's going up Arbor Parkway is, is a, a contract under a contract. And like I said, it's, uh, it's starting now and we should see a big difference within a week, a lot of the trees coming down. Uh, and the other thing uh, is, is this map, and I don't know if the mayor's going to talk about this map. Okay, I'll let him talk about it, but it ends up that I am now uh, the representative for all of Arbor Station. I used to be a, a representative for just a few of you, a little bit of Arbor Crossing and some in Knollwood, and that was it. We had actually, at one time, we had four representatives for Arbor Station. That is gone. So and I'll let the mayor take care of all the rest of that information, but I am your representative now and uh, also the mayor pro tem. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Yaki. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce to you Councilman Mark Adams. You like to say a few words? Don't, don't be bashful now. And then we have with us also Councilman McLean. You'd like to say a few words? Okay, they're, they're a little bashful, but don't believe that. But 
You have myself, seven other council members, not just the council member, Mayor Pro Tem, that represents your ward, but you have mayor and seven council members that represent you as a city. Uh, certainly we have ward council people that represent specific wards within the city, but let me assure you, they all take your interest to heart in the whole city and what we're doing to govern the city and manage the processes that are in place. Have excellent people that are very committed to what they're doing, the amount of time that they spend to make sure that you have the type city that you want, that it's well protected, and you get the type services that you want. Let me introduce to you a couple of the staff members, if I may. First of all, Bill Osborne. Bill's a city manager and has been for 20, 22 years now. And let me assure you, nowhere will you find a city manager where that's more committed, more dedicated, and more passionate than the one that we have working for us within the city of Douglasville. And the expertise and knowledge that Bill brings to the job is heads and shoulders above what so many other cities have. But not only that, a lot of times you can have the knowledge and experience in the background, but you don't have the dedication and commitment. And let me assure you, assure you that Bill has that. We also have with us, to, yes sir. <clears throat> Bill has somewhat of a vested interest in this neighborhood as well as the city and what goes on and making sure things happen as they should happen. Then we have with us uh, Jeff Knowles, and I've got uh, Jeff's cards here because Jeff's wearing two different hats now. Jeff's also the executive director for our city development authority, but Jeff is also the director of development services and also city engineer. Jeff is, he's a Georgia Tech graduate. <laughs> Jeff's a Georgia Tech graduate, and Je Jeff's proud of that, and we're certainly proud of it also. Jeff does a great job for us, and I've uh, been with the city now 10 years. 10 years, very passionate, very dedicated. Uh, Jeff doesn't live in Arbor Station, but he does live right downtown. We also have with us Joyce Stone, who is our city clerk. And Joyce, you've been with the city now how long? 12? And you're saying she's not much older than that, but Je uh, Joyce has been with us 12 years, does a great job, and we're glad to have her. And we have her husband, Stoney, with us tonight, and uh, we're glad to have Joyce with us. Also, we have Chris Womack, who is our chief of police. Chris has been with the city now 20... If I wake up in the morning, it's 23 years. Oh, we, we hope you're going to wake up in the morning. Twenty-three years, Chris started with the city after four years. Well, first of all, Chris grew up in Douglasville, graduated from Douglas County High School, went off, spent four years in the Marine Corps, came back to Douglasville, went to work as a patrolman, and then worked his way up and now is chief of police. Also, while he was working his way up to chief of police, he also attained his bachelor's degree and then also a master's degree in public administration, as well as going to the FBI Academy. So with that, have I, I don't believe, I, have I missed anybody? Now, we also have with us, and you see the cameras and the folks in the background, we have with City TV, we have Nathan Todd with us and Steve Jones. Let me tell you, and, and I'm gonna wrap some of this up and tell you where I've been going with it. But we have City TV. We started City, well, I say we, City did, I wasn't there. But City TV back, what, Bill, in 2006? 2006. So it's been up and going for six years now. But let me tell you a little bit about the city's City TV and the expertise and the skill level that they have. A thing called GMA, which is the Georgia Municipal Association, which is an organization, association of cities, 
in affiliations within the state of Georgia. There's 500 and something cities that are members, and it's kind of like maybe a trade association, if you will. But they're very good as far as training and expertise, education, and a lot of other uh, skill sets that they help cities with around the state. We have a, a large conference down in Savannah every year, and this is the fourth year running that they asked City TV to come down there and they took video and uh, put together a, a, a video presentation that they use for the opening session. Uh, and there's usually about 2,500, 3,000 people in this opening session. Like I said, fourth year running, they've asked City TV to come and do that. And they pay for all their expenses, their lodging, putting them up and everything to put that on. So it tells you a little bit about the skill set and the professionalism that your city, City TV, has. So as you can see, just introducing a few of these folks, you can see tenure, experience, dedication, commitment, passion, and professionalism to the job. So we wanted you to be able to meet some of them, see some of them, and find out what kind of people you have that are helping run the city of Douglasville and provide you with the services that you won't need. Let me just quickly go over a couple of things and then like I said, then I wanna open it up to um, you for questions and comments. Talk to you a little bit about finance. First of all, I'm a fiscal conservative. I talked about that in campaigning. I believe that the monies that we have to operate with, we need to be good stewards of because it's your money. We get it from taxes and fees that we impose, a uh, certain amount of other things that the city does to help generate income, but it's your money. It's not our money. It's your money. We just are, good, are, are stewards of it, and I want to ensure that we are good stewards of those monies and resources that you allow us to manage. It's yours, not ours. And in saying that, we just approved uh, back in June the fiscal year 2012-2013 budget. Now, we had a 9% decrease over last year's budget. Now, that may not seem like much to you, but that's a 9% decrease with the decrease in revenues that we've been getting. As most, and we had a little bit of conversation about this before the meeting when people talking about the value of their homes being down, the appraised value. And the appraised value decreases the amount of revenue because of the taxes and the millage rate that's imposed. So we've had a decline in revenues and resources coming in. And what do we do? We need to tighten up, make sure we're managing our budget, which is your money. So we had a 9% decrease. We looked at across the board. We didn't have a across the board decrease, but City manager is the one that's responsible for the budget, putting it together, then presents it to the city council after we've looked at and helped with the process, and then we approve it. One of the things that we did was challenge the city manager and staff to put together a budget that would be very prudent in the spending and have decreases where we could have decreases. So it wasn't just an arbitrary across the board decrease. But like I said, we are no different than you. We need to have a budget. We need to be sure that it's very responsible. And that's what we're going to do. And I can assure you that we want to be and are going to be good stewards of your money and the resources that you allow us to manage. Public safety. <clears throat> I'm going to just open that up. Then I'll defer to the chief had to go out and take a call, which happens a lot of times because you might imagine he's we, we have a hundred or right at give or take a hundred sworn officers within the city of Douglasville we have a new state-of-the-art police facility roughly 22 23 million dollar facility over on Fairburn Road has everybody seen that <clears throat> anybody hadn't be glad at any point in time if you haven't seen it or would like to go through let us know be glad to give you a tour, take you through, because who does it belong to? It belongs to you. It's your building, it's your resources, and certainly as a city and city employees, 
we're proud of it, but we want you to be proud of it. So, like I said, we have a state-of-the-art facility, but we have excellent people running that facility. And I'm going to defer here to the chief in just a minute. Chief has, well, with the chief and hit the command staff, chief, there's what, seven, eight, including you in command staff? Eight. Eight. Eight in the command staff. Anybody like to guess of the eight, how many of those officers have master's degrees? Anybody like to guess? What would you guess? Seven of them. Seven of the eight have at least a master's degree, either in criminal justice, public administration, or there may be one or two of the other sciences, but a master's degree. And the other thing, if you were to take and combine the years of experience with the city, and we need to do that, Chief, and total that up one day, and I'm just going through mine, um, <clears throat> Most of the ones that I know on command staff started out as patrolmen, didn't they? Started out as patrolmen and didn't have their degrees with maybe the exception of deputy chief. Didn't he have his bachelor's when he came? Or Yeah, we had, um, of command staff, we had three people currently on command staff, I believe, that started out with a four-year degree with us. Okay. But the rest of them then, while they were working, went to, went to school while they were working, but then... All of them got their master's degrees while they were working. So you can see there's a big commitment there to the city of Douglasville. There's not a big turnover in personnel, but the commitment, dedication, professionalism. I put the quality uh, and professionalism of our police department up against any in the country. And I say all that to say because public safety is something that's very important to y'all. It's very important to us. And we want to make sure that you're getting the level of protection that you want and need. As we all know, society is changing. There are things going on out there today that are a little different than most of you a lot younger than I am. But uh, when I was growing up, it was a little different. I, I thought about when I graduated from high school, went off to college, I thought about, I don't even think I had keys to the front door. I don't think we ever locked the house I, or that I remember. But it's different. So we have to adapt and adjust to that, and we do that by making sure that we have an excellent police department, make sure they're equipped properly, and making sure that the people are properly trained. So, Chief, let me turn it over to you and let you make a few comments, if you would, about uh, public safety stats, maybe, and uh, what you see. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. One thing that I do want to piggyback on with the mayor's comments that I like to brag about, particularly in command staff, uh, you heard the, the mayor mention earlier that I attended the FBI Academy back in 2007. Um, actually, Georgia only gets about six slots a year for certified officers to attend the FBI training, which is a 10-week academy up at Quantico, Virginia, and probably as far as law enforcement goes, uh, the, the, the cream of the cream of, as to far as getting to go to training class somewhere is to get to go to their basic mandate up there in Quantico. Um, not only myself, but the deputy chief and the major have all been. So to have three officers that have been to that program and when the whole state only gets six slots a year tells you the level of people you got working for you here in Douglasville um, and have been at it a long time. Um, and, and a majority of, of my command staff also, they're from here. And I think that makes a difference when people have that commitment coming in because they're, they're making a conscientious choice to police. And it's not always, there's some, there's some benefits, but there's some negatives to policing where you live. I grew up here, and, and I'll never forget the first time that I told my dad that I was going to work when I came home from the Marine Corps, uh, that I was gonna go work for the police department. My dad just laughed and said, wow, won't that be a switch? Um, <laughs> Because as, as a kid, I was probably one of the ones running through here that y'all was probably calling on, saying, my God, y'all get that kid to slow down, he's going to hurt somebody. I drove too fast um, many times and got caught many times when I was a kid for that. Um, but things are a lot different out here. Um, one thing that I'd like to mention as far as the job and the we doing for the citizens of Douglasville, back in the late 80s when I started doing this, we locked up the same 20 or 30 guys over and over. We knew them, they knew us, we had a relationship with them. We knew the ones that would fight us when we showed up, and we knew the ones that you could just open the door and they'd crawl in the back of the car and go and say, let's go, let's go get this over with. Um, but these young cats that we're dealing out here now, they don't care. They, they don't respect their own life, much less that of your, yours or, or the police officers. Um, unfortunately, there's a, a large sector of, of these young criminals that we deal with now 
they, they want to hurt you just because you're wearing a badge. They, they despise what you stand for. And uh, that's, that's just a sign of the times that we live in. And uh, like I said, they'll hurt you for no reason, much less if they could get $5 off of you. So, so we have to be aware of that. We have to train our people for that. Um, the mindset of the people that we're recruiting to do this job is different. Um, it's tough for us to d develop the company loyalty that we once had when people were um, back when I grew up in this job. Now, young guys, they do this for three or four years and, and they're not a sergeant or lieutenant, they're gonna leave you for $5,000 more a year. They'll, somebody, Marta, go over there and they'll ride that train for five more thousand dollars a year, not thinking about what it's gonna cost them in gas or, or what they're giving up because some of the benefits they may have staying here in Douglasville. That's just the nature of the beast and that's very expensive, the money that we put in on the front end to train these people um, that, that we pour into them, not only with equipment, but to send them through mandate school and everything, send them through an FTO program to train them for somebody else. So we have to be aware with that and we have to really work hard to make sure we're getting people on the front side that are committed to the cause and the direction that you expect us to lead the men and women out here serving your community and, and the police department. Um, far as Arbor Station goes, um, the, com the complex, the complexion of, uh, of your subdivision has changed over the years since I was a kid. Um, of course, there's much more rental properties here that were not here uh, back in my younger days as police. And when you start having an influx of rental property, um, sometimes you start losing some of that sense of ownership. Uh, we are aware of a couple of houses that the city's working on that um, they're just in shambles. We, we know that. The, I can assure you, your city council members and the mayor are talking about it, even as up to so current as this week. We're aware of that. I had a couple of you come up to me and say, hey, Chief, we really like when we see those black and whites down in here sitting on stop signs. Um, folks, we're trying to be as responsive as we can and, uh, and be as visible as we can, but um, some departments out here are some spots in government may have slowed down. Uh, business is good in the police department. There's no shortage of folks wanting to go to jail out here. So we're locking a lot of folks up and, uh, and we're trying to keep you as safe as we can. Um, what I want to pledge to y'all uh, in wrapping this up is, is to be accessible to you. Um, my desk phone rolls over to my cell phone, which is on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that means if I'm off out of state, I always try to answer my phone. I think it's that important. Um, you know, growing up, I never dreamed I would be entrusted in the level of position that I'm in tonight. Stand here before you as the chief of police, I've been so blessed. And I know it's by the grace of God that's allowed me to get this far as to where I am doing what I'm doing and doing what I love. I love this job. Um, we, we try to create a family environment at the police department. Um, past two Saturday nights, I've done movie nights for the guys just to get the spouses, the kids all up there. So we can spend family time together and get the families to understand it's important that we, they are also included in what we're doing and what we got going so they support us. Um, we reach out to the community. We hold town hall meetings once a quarter over at the police department. I encourage you all to do that. We've got Assistance Police Academy. If you're interested in police work, please reach out to that. Um, it's a great program, 10 weeks, and you'll really get a good taste of what we're doing at the police department. And also, we're still doing our free handgun clinic every other Thursday night. Um, Lieutenant Brad Stafford, if you need more contact numbers, I'll be glad to provide that. It's a great program, teach you some education in the classroom, then take you down on a range. And once again, let me thank y'all. Y'all stepped up for us in a down economy when everybody's hurting out here and everybody's wallet's getting squeezed. The last drop of blood out of it, y'all stepped up for us and got us out of, and I'm going to call it what is the, the, the rat hole up there on Church Street. It was just, it was never designed to be a public safety facility. It was very dangerous for our folks working there and the bad guys in there. Uh, it was a dangerous place to try to operate out of. We have a state-of-the-art facility that I'm so proud of. I love to show off. If you've not had a chance to come see it, contact me directly. I'll get you in there and make sure you get to see it. Other than that, like I said, I've got cards here tonight. Y'all, please reach out to me. If you ever need me down here in Arbor Station for anything you got going, I want to be here for you and make myself available. Thank y'all. Thank you, Chief. One thing, we do have a problem with the Chief, and, and I guess this is probably as good a time as any to share it with you, and he's really not expecting this. But... Uh, we're trying to work to make him a little more passionate about his job and what he does and his commitment. <laughs> but bear with us. We're working with it. It's, it's a work in progress. I said that, and I say it facetiously, but you'll find that with all of your city employees and your mayor 
and your counsel. We're very passionate and believe in what we're doing. We believe in the city of Douglasville and we're committed to you and working to give you the best services that we can. Now, we're not perfect. We have a little bump in the road every now and then and you know, have a little curve here and there, but it's not intentional. Like I said, uh, very passionate, very committed to what we do. We believe in the city of Douglasville and want you to know and understand that. Transportation, talk to you just re real briefly about transportation. You hear a lot about Highway 92, the widening, the extension. That's an ongoing project. I've been in Douglasville for 35 years, was on the council several years ago. It was a topic of conversation then. I came back on the council and I thought, Gosh, we're still talking. Well, I knew we were still talking about it anyway because I uh, came off the council, but it didn't go far. But we're actually in the acquiring of right-of-way now. The Department of Transportation is actively acquiring right-of-way. Engineering studies have been done. The biggest thing with it, there's $95 million that's either been, it depends on who you're talking to. Some people say it's been allocated. Some say it's been appropriated, and, I, and, and when you say that, well, you say, who's saying, well, just got back from a trip to Washington, and you say, well, gosh, why would, you know, the mayor, why would he go to Washington? Well, it's a trip that's an annual trip that's sponsored by the, uh, well, really, it's sponsored by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and then local chambers of commerce within each community uh, get together a delegation from their community and their chamber of commerce to go to Washington to talk to the congressional delegation about things that we're trying to get for our community and work on for our community. Went up Monday, came back Wednesday. We were able to meet with Senator Shambliss, Senator Isaacson, Congressman Westmoreland, Congressman Scott. And some of you may say, well, you know, one's a Republican and one's a Democrat. Folks, that doesn't matter when you're talking to your congressional delegation and you're talking about getting funding and monies for your community that is going to help make it a better place to live. When you're talking about legislation that's going to affect all of us, whether it be uh, in the area of finance, budgets, uh, illegal immigration, transportation, public safety, all of those issues of, uh, that, that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, and it puts us in front of them, allows us to talk with them, them to talk to us, and to keep those lines of communications open. That was the purpose of the trip. It was a very intense trip. And we had meetings the whole time we were there. We met with several other congressmen, both state, I mean both Senate and House, during the trip. But we were able to meet with our local delegation and the people that represent us in the state of Georgia or in our congressional districts. But the area of transportation as it relates to Highway 92 and the $95 million that com that's committed to that, and you ask, well, you know, why? But what that will do, that transportation is a key, er key issue all across America and within local communities and certainly within our community. Uh, having very viable arteries of transportation helps the economy, it stimulates jobs, is it stimulates jobs and growth, but quality growth. And that's something that we want to be sure that we're doing. Growth is inevitable. You, you, you can't stop it. When I first moved out here 35 years ago, guess where I-20 stopped? <laughs> Highway 5. I tell some people that and they say, well, how'd you get to Alabama? It's like, you know, well, and, and I say, well, you took Highway 78. And I've had a couple of people like, Highway 78 goes to Alabama? Yeah, it's a long way going that way, but eventually it'll get you to Alabama. But we've grown. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue to grow. Growth is inevitable. When I moved out here 35 years ago, believe it or not, there were people that wanted to put up a gate at I-20 and stop it. Well, guess what? Here we are 35 years later, and the guy that moved in yesterday, guess what he wants to do? 
He wants to put up a gate and stop it. He's the last guy in and don't want anybody else coming. Well, that's not real world. It's not going to happen. Now, what do you do? The key is controlled quality growth. And that's what we want. We want controlled growth and we want it to be quality growth. We want it to be companies that are going to be good community partners with us that are going to interact and work with the communities to help us grow and be the viable community that we want to be. And then also the companies that are going to help stimulate the economy and provide the jobs that we're all looking for and talking about on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're working in transportation to make sure we uh, develop the transportation properly. Economic development, we're taking a very active approach to economic development. And as I just explained to you, the reason for that. You know, the old deal of, you know, we'll just build it and they'll come. Well, that's not exactly true, you know. And then if they come, we want to make sure it's what we want to become, want to come. So we're being very proactive with that. And I'm going to turn it over in just a second to, to uh, Jeff Knowles, who's our executive director of our development authority and let him talk to you just a little bit but also is anybody anybody doesn't know where the new conference center is going to be it's going to be downtown 14 and a half, 15 million dollar give or take a dollar or two project it's going to be a state-of-the-art conference center it's going to be a state-of-the-art facility that there's nothing like it in west georgia we're going to have it right here in Douglasville, but we want to be sure that we're attracting the right people, be sure that we're attracting the right conferences, and what will that do? That'll help stimulate growth, hopefully help stimulate the right people to come to town, to eat at the restaurants, uh, stay at the hotels, buy gas, trade at our regional mall. And you say, well, what's the deal with that? Well, we have a local option sales tax that we lovingly refer to as lost. But that extra 1% sales tax, guess what that allows? That allows us to roll back your property taxes, and it saves all of us money. Well, how does it do that? You ride through the mall sometime, and you look at some of those tags on those cars. They're uh, Kawita, Carroll, Paulding, Harrelson. And every time they buy something, they leave a little penny that we get. And you say, well, what's the big deal there? Well, it enables us to roll back your property tax or the millage rate roughly half. Saves you money. Saves you taxes. So, um, and I'm going to talk in a minute about the loss negotiations in city county development. But before I do, I want to turn it over to Jeff and ask him to talk a little bit about uh, our comprehensive planning, city growth, development, and that type of thing. Jeff. I, thank you, Mayor. Um, economic development, uh, oftentimes in communities, and, and I've just come from a, a conference where uh, the state got together, and, and you really, until you see how it impacts the region, the state as a whole, you really don't get the bigger picture of, of the, the, I guess, the uh, financial contributions that a lot of these companies are bringing. Uh, somebody said, well, you know, economic development, y'all just give away our tax money and bring, you know, companies in here. And that's based on the incentive uh, argument. Well, if we didn't give that money away, it wasn't money we were going to get anyway because they weren't ever going to be here. But because they're here, they're able to provide jobs and, and uh, shopping in our, in our facilities and, and utilizing all of our, our resources uh, to the extent that they don't put people in schools, and, and that's mostly where our taxes go. Uh, when you pay property tax, about 90% of that goes into the schools. They're not putting people in schools. Uh, Incentive-wise, uh, I believe we all know now, we have Google in our community, uh, and they received an incentive. Uh, just like most companies that uh, it contribute a, a large financial uh, resource to, to really putting jobs in our community, uh, they, uh, they received an incentive and they didn't pay property tax to a certain rate uh, for a certain number of years. But I can count in the recent past about a half million dollars that they've contributed to this community. Not in taxes, not because they were forced to pay it, not because it was their duty, because they felt as though 
it was their civic duty as a corporate citizen to provide, uh, I guess, a return to the community that, that embraced them. Uh, a lot of that is back into the schools. Uh, they're about, a, I believe, uh, right now we're at about $300,000 that they've contributed to our local schools uh, all across this county, from elementary to middle to high school. They've put their money where their mouth is. So economic development uh, is, is, a, is a bigger picture thing. Baxter uh, recently landed in Georgia. It's a billion dollar project. That's gonna be far reaching. Uh, Caterpillar, we all hear about Caterpillar in the news. Kia, you hear about all kinds of things about how Kia wasn't good for Georgia. Well, Kia is good for Georgia. Kia does more than just that plant. That plant put people to work and it, and it will continue to do that. And when that's, that's really our goal here in the city of Douglasville as an active approach to economic development is to make sure that we're out there courting, recruiting those corporate citizens that we want. That we want. We're not sitting back waiting for those individuals to come to us and say, hey, we sure would like to be in your community. Now, we identify the list of, of the types of companies that we're looking for. Uh, we have, uh, we're being one of the smallest uh, counties and cities in the state of Georgia, uh, not population-wise, but land mass-wise, we have a, a limited resource. That's our available land. So we're very particular about who we can go after. We don't have uh, you know, the large tracts of land that some other communities have that where they can plop down warehouses here and there and, and eat up a million square feet at a time. Uh, we're, we're steadily running out of that land. And unless we're redeveloping land, uh, we, don't, we don't really have anything else to work with. So we are actively pursuing, but patiently actively pursuing those, uh, those companies that we've identified as what we want to see in our community. Uh, that being those higher paying jobs, uh, the uh, higher recruiting, higher employed uh, type facilities where it's not just a warehouse with five fort forklift operators. Uh, we're trying to put uh, those companies on the ground in our community that will give back to the community. I believe the mayor said we're going to talk about a comprehensive plan. Uh, the city is guided by a comprehensive plan. It's a document that we do uh, every 10 years. We're getting ready to get started on it again. Uh, the last one I was a part of very early on in my tenure here at the city of Douglasville. And uh, this one uh, we hope to be uh, as good a, if not better document than we've had in the past so that we can continue to guide our path. It's something that we use. Uh, it's required by the state government uh, that we have one in place in order to continue to have our uh, municipal status. Uh, but we'll continue to uh, keep everybody informed as we're working through that. Uh, I believe there will be a number of community meetings uh, associated with it, uh, with stakeholder groups, just trying to make sure that uh, everybody's aware of what we're doing. Uh, that'll start next year, some, late this year sometime, and we'll finish it up next year. Um, Mayor, did I cover everything? I think that. Uh, and if anybody... Everybody needs me, like Chris, I've got cards in my pocket and I sure would uh, love to, to walk you around the, the city and, uh, and show you through our maps and uh, let you know uh, anything you're, you're asking, uh, asking about. Two other items and then I'll open it up for, for questions. One of them is city-county cooperation. One of the things that I heard, or I guess one of the biggest things, during the campaign was city county cooperation and i can assure you as i stand here that that's happening cooperation between mayor and the county chairman as well as the elected official the other elected officials and city and county staff a good evidence is that in you read probably a lot of, about it in the newspaper over the last few months, and that's what we call the lost negotiations. And law stands for local option sales tax. I told you a little bit about the local option sales tax, what it is, and you say, well, you know, how much is that or what does it amount to? And to give you an idea, the total local option sales tax, that one little penny that you voted to impose on yourself for spending that takes place throughout the county is approximately, give or take a dollar or two, 235 to 240 million over the next 10 year period. Now how that works is there's a very 
may not be to you, it was very to me, complicated process of how you figure out the distribution of those proceeds or that amount of money. County gets so much, city gets so much. And then there are two other cities that have much smaller county population that they get a certain portion of it. And the way and, and you arrive at this by state legislation. Used to before or well the last time ten years ago it took place, it was pretty well arrived at by population percentages. And the state legislature developed legislation that in, now includes not only population but eight other criteria that you take into account to arrive at the percentages of distribution. So there's, there's a process that's involved, but then if to, for the negotiation, but if the different entities, city, county, can't come to some kind of conclusion, then you go into an arbitration, kind of like baseball arbitration. Then if you can't work out, or will you, through that, then you end up going to court and a judge has to decide on what it is. City and the county worked together, had some conversations back and forth, negotiations back and forth. And what was, what has it been now, Bill, about three weeks, four weeks ago, we were able to arrive at a successful conclusion on what that distribution and allocation should be, which saved us having to go to court. And you say, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, the longer you spend and the more time you spend in court or getting to court and attorney's fees and consultant fees and all that's involved with that, guess where that money comes from? It comes from your tax money. So through the, the, the good city and county negotiations and uh, collaborative efforts that we have right now, we're able to negotiate, settle that, and so we're having very good city and county um, cooperation right now. We're getting ready to start what's called the service delivery portion of it, and that's things like fire, uh, police protection, maintenance, streets. That's the service delivery portion of it. And there's portions that we share and the county shares, and we have to figure out what the fair and equitable distribution of that is. And we're going to be entering into that here shortly. But we'll resolve that, negotiate it, and we're having good city-county cooperation, which works better for you as the citizen, your city residents, your county residents. You want to see good leadership and good cooperation so that you're getting the type of governance that you expect and want. So we're working hard to see that that happens. Lastly, I'll, and I'll wrap it up, open it up for questions. The map that Mayor Pro Tem Yaki referred to uh, originally, and really currently, uh, there's a different ward map, and Arbor Station was broken up into four different wards, and you had four different council people that actually represented you. And after the first of the year, we looked at it, reevaluated it, and came up with a new map. And this is, and if you see, it says proposed ward map. That was the new map that we worked out after the first of the year, and that map has been submitted to Justice Department for their approval, which we don't expect any problems with, and this will be the new ward map, and as you can see, Arbor Station is in one ward. You're represented by one council person, and that's Mayor Pro Tem Yaki. We felt that that would be the better way to represent the people. So communities of common interest are better represented when they're not, the communities are not broken up. We haven't been able to quite get that concept and that idea across to our state legislators or our congressional representatives, but we're working on it. So with all that being said, I'll open it up to questions, comments, whether it's in, in, in anything, whether it's public safety, the economy, well, I don't know that I can answer questions about the economy, but I'll certainly try to answer how we're dealing with it. Yes, yeah. sir. If you would give us your name for the audio portion, please. Yeah, my name's <clears throat> Kerry Stinchcomb. Are we going to hire any more code enforcement officers? Any more code enforcement officers? Right now, we have 
to code enforcement officers. Code enforcement comes under the police department. We have a captain that actually oversees code enforcement. We have a corporal that, that in is the supervisor, and then we have two code enforcement officers. And at this point, there's not any plans to hire additional ones at this point. Okay. I got one more question. All right, sir. What does the city slash county pay for indigent health care to the hospital? That's a good question, and to be honest with you, I don't have the answer. But I, if, if you'll give us your name, phone number, I'll get that, and we'll get it back to you. I, I, at this point, I really don't know. I can tell you, though. Uh, or is it $10 or 10000 I, I don't know what the city actually pays toward it, towards it, but I can tell you this. I know that Wellstar, if you go back and, and say the last maybe four or five years ago, say five years ago, I do know that their indigent care write-off was roughly 20 million. Then it went to 40 million. Then it went to 60 million. And the last I heard, and this was, I think maybe not this last year's budget, but prior year budget, it was 90 million. Now that's, Wellstar consists of Douglas General, I believe Cobb, Kennestone, what else? There's about four or five hospitals that are in the Wellstar group. So that'll give you an idea of, now that they are required by federal law. If an indigent comes in, somebody comes in an emergency room, they can't refuse treatment. But somebody what we're pays. actually contributing, I don't know, Bill, are we contributing anything of that or you know? Basically all of the county taxes are contributed in some way. The city government uh, does not because all of us also are And that's one of those items that will probably be discussed when, when Bill talks about county services that are provided. You, you, and when the county have something in the budget, whether it be public safety through the sheriff's department or with the fire department, there's a certain amount of that that we have. It's just like we have a contract with the county for uh, animal control, uh, fire control or fire safety and then we have some expenses and monies that we pay towards that and that's part of the service delivery strategy that we'll be getting into here shortly determining you know the county may think we're paying a fair share we may think that that we're not or we may think that we're paying more than our fair share so indigent care may be something that, that may come up it used to be on your tax bill I don't know, but if you'll give us your name, phone number, we'll get, we'll find out. We'll get you more information. We'll get back to you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Name and the, take the microphone so we'll have that for the uh, video portion. Give us your name and address, or your name and uh, give us your question, please, ma'am. Um, I'm Stephanie Langford, and I live here in Arbor Station. And we noticed that the, since Kmart has left, that it's just an empty building right now. But we noticed that uh, I think it's temporary. There's a Halloween, um, some kind of Halloween store in there right now. And I don't really think that that's permanent. But has anybody indicated that they might be interested in renting or putting something else there? I, since we live here, I'd just like to see not an empty building sitting there. Yes, ma'am. And I agree with that. I'm. I'm I live right down Douglas, right downtown Douglasville. So what you're saying when you look around and the, and well, the question was, is or are we doing anything? I guess about empty buildings, more specifically the Kmart building. That's one of the things through our economic development and be, us being aggressive, going out there and looking to try to find the specific types of businesses we would like to relocate to Douglasville. And one of the things with that is making sure that we have a list of inventory of what we call either shovel ready or f facilities that are already available. Give you a good example of that. And this is prior to me going on the, on the council, but the old Walmart shopping center that you saw, uh, it stood vacant for how many years, Jeff? Over 10 years. And through the city staff, prior mayor and city council working together, 
were able to attract and work out or facilitate some things to bring Georgia Highlands College there, which is a part of a, the university system and is state accredited school. They started out with 75 students two, three years ago, two years ago, two years ago, they're up to 500 students now. And as a result of that, you're seeing other uh, uh, businesses locate in that mall because there's a draw and uh, something that would interest them to, to, to come into the mall or come into that shopping center. So to answer your question, we're concerned about empty buildings. We want to see somebody back in the buildings. We're working to try to attract the, the right type of uh, companies to come to those empty buildings and also sites that we have available. So we're very much interested in it and working on it. Yes, ma'am. Other questions? Don't be bad. I really don't know. Yes, sir. You can get your name. Ron Daly. Uh, I work for AMAC Consulting Firm, which is, uh, we work for Department of Transportation. I finished the cable barrier project on I-20. And you mentioned something about 92. And right now I'm working out of Butt Cannon, area office, area five. So I pick up in Paulding County. So I don't really know the specifics about Douglas, but uh, our surveying crews are working full time in <coughs> Paulding County, and we're probably looking to start uh, 2015 is what our Paulding County end is, is going. And right now we're working with Carroll County. I work there, I've got a project over 166 on 27, but Transportation, as you mentioned, is is a major thing for any community. And I'm just glad to be here in Douglas County and in this area for its, you know, its progressive. Thank you, Mr. Daly, and we're certainly glad to have you here. Any other questions, comments? Again, don't be bashful. It's your meeting, it's your city. We're here for you. Let me, let me say this. <clears throat> Me as mayor, your city council, staff, we're here and we exist for one thing. You know what that is? For you. There's no disillusionment about why we're here and what we're here for. We're here to meet your needs and provide you with the services that you won't need and expect as a city. And you probably heard me campaign on my goal is to help make, not to make, because I'm not going to do anything by myself. It takes all of the staff that you see working together, police department, as well as you, our citizens, working together to help make Douglasville, our community, be one of the premier places in America. Live, work, play, raise a family, and have a safe environment while we're doing all that. And you, you know, I've had somebody or people tell me, we know that's a pretty big goal. Well, so. What's wrong with that? And I've challenged people from when I first started campaigning over a year and a half ago, give me a reason why we can't do it. And as yet, I haven't had anybody give me a reason why we can't do it. Think about it. We have all of the, the, the things that we need. First of all, we already have a great community. I've lived here 35 years. Fortunately, I've been able to retire, uh, and now I'm working full-time again. <laughs> but I'm working full-time doing what I have a passion for and what I want to do. I've been involved with the city of Douglasville and our community for the better part of 25 years and have never made one nickel of my living to support my family and my household within the city. But it's because I have a passion for it and a love for it. and. I built a house right down, some of you know where I live, some of you don't. 14 years ago, I built a house right downtown Douglasville. Could almost throw a rock to Hunter Park. And at that point in time, I could have lived anywhere in the state of Georgia, certainly in the Atlanta metropolitan area, to do what I did to make a living. 
I chose to stay in Douglasville, Douglas County, because I love the community, love the county, raise my family here, and want to stay here. But if I'm going to stay here, I need to be involved. And each and every one of you that's here tonight show that you're involved, you're committed, you're here. A lot of other places you could be, a lot of other things you could be doing. So I applaud you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here, to listen, to talk, and be a part of our community. Because it's your community. It's our community. It takes all of us working together, pulling together, making the community we want it to be. Questions? Anything else? Staff, council members, anybody have anything? I would just like to talk about the Kmart situation. I've been in contact with Kmart, and not with Kmart, but with the leasing company, uh, the, the management company that's uh, uh, running out that space. And they have been receiving a lot of input uh, for that building. So there is something coming, and uh, we just don't know what at this time. So, yes, they're they're aggressively marketing that building. Anything else? I told you we'd open it up, close on time. We're a little bit beyond the time we said we'd be. It's uh, 7.33, but uh, like I said, want to value your time. I'm gonna be around. I think uh, probably council members, a couple of staff will be around. If you got any individual questions, we're certainly open to them. One last thing in closing. Like I said, I've been involved in city or county for the last 25, almost 30 years. I've lived in Douglasville for 35 years. And when I campaigned, I put my phone number on little push cards that I handed out as well as business cards, put probably 10,000 of them out. Had my home phone number on there. Same phone number, it's been listed in the phone book for the last 35 years. I was on the council once before for almost seven years, served on the zoning board for five, counties planning and zoning board for seven. I'm accessible 24 and seven. Only thing I ask is if you call and you got grass up to about here, or you got a barking dog next door, don't call me at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Unless that dog's trying to get in your house <clears throat> And then I would encourage you to call 911. <laughs> but seriously, um, I know probably half of you in the room, uh, you know I'm committed to Douglasville and Douglas County. And like I said, I'm easily accessible at City Hall. Or if you can't get a hold of me during the day at City Hall, you call me at home. I'll return your phone calls. So with that, no other comments. Anybody else have anything? We'll adjourn. And thank you for being here.